Good evening and welcome to Shop Night Live. I'm looking forward to tonight to share with you a very cool technique that I've been working on. The technique is to create a designer-like veneer that looks like patchwork or woven wood. So um, almost like a woven basket effect. And I made this little sample. This is in chestnut. You could just take material as veneer and assemble it at right angles to each other, just basically a parquet floor. You know, you could do that and you would get like a nice kind of effect. That's kind of the look, the parquet, except it wasn't all warm eaten like this chestnut. But um, what I decided to do was add some 3D dimension to it. So uh, the way to do that is to take a plain flat piece and first dome it. So let's see, I've got one of these that's just plain domed, okay. You can see how it's slightly curved. Now these pieces started out, I believe at um, close to 316s. Yeah, touch more. Uh, and this was just for demonstration, this piece. These, these are two and a half by two and a half. And I just, shape them so that on the edges they went down to uh, just under an eighth. So yeah. So you're getting some of that kind of shape there. And then the next step is to add texture which gives it even more dimension and a tactile kind of experience and the way the light reflects off it makes it really warm and uh, unusual. Now, not every wood will create this texture, but here's a textured piece. So you're getting that 3D textured effect, almost like driftwood. Um, but not every wood does this. Another good wood, though, that does is Wenge. Check that out. Wenge is a dark hardwood that has these lighter growth rings. Can you see it on with that better? And Man, it's so nice when you get that textured up. And this is a cutoff that I had from that um, coffee table. The, what did I call that? The lily pad. Yeah. So you can see that light grain. That's the softer wood. So when, in order to texture it, you've got to uh, abrade that somehow. You could sandblast it and it would take it out. There's this new technique you see a lot on uh, YouTube with Soji Bond, where you take a flame torch and you burn it, and then you brush it, and off goes the soft char, which is the softer wood. And then you're left with that texture and also the burned kind of char marks and all that. Um, but I'm gonna use a wire brush to create this effect so you can see how how it's textured, but then I was experimenting on this piece with shellac. And so after you wire brush it, you just basically take away all that soft growth. And so you end up with what looks almost like ebony. It takes away those lighter streaks. And when you finish it, there's no color on that. It just looks like ebony. When you look really close, you can see it's got a little more of a slight brownish, but man, it looks very close to ebony, but with texture. So it's takes a piece of your work to another level, you know, um, where you, you think about form and shape and all of in, in your design, but then you can think of this 3D effect. So you can just flat out texture wood, but you can also make a pattern with it, texture that to create a woven wood effect. One of the things that you can do is apply this uh, patchwork pattern to a flat surface to create that woven texture. But I wanted to step it up a little bit and I shared with the folks here at the Epic Weekend some photos of a, like a uh, sleigh bed that I did that has a curve to it. And that's how I really love it when it's laid over a curve. So I've been thinking about our jewelry box and whether or not this would be an appropriate topping <laughs> for a jewelry box like 
put it right here on the top and we'd open we'd have all those jewels inside almost like a treasure chest with woven wood on top the feedback i got those who did talk to me about it uh was probably too masculine for uh, a girl's jewelry box and i and i do tend to agree but that woven wood almost is more of a keepsake box like a little treasure chest or it could be a humidor if you're into that um, whatever this is a great palette to start with and to think about how we're going to put some woven material on there what we've got to do is create our our weave in such a way that it can bend over the surface so if you think about it you've got these little uh, pieces these little squares and they've got to flex somewhat over the surface and in this case we've got you know a pretty strong curve so if you look at this we've got that curve and that piece is not laying flat first of all it's too thick and secondly it's a little too large for such a small area like this to cover with the so we're going to make our squares smaller and we're going to be thinner than that so in order to make the squares, what I did was I took some stock and I resawed some chestnut. I actually didn't resaw it. I, I had a flat board and I just sawed little thin strips. Resawing is when you cut the piece vertically like that, like you, you change the thickness of the boards, the overall thickness. Uh, this I actually just sawed off the edge of a piece of chestnut that was about an inch and a half thick. So I ran a bunch of strips on the bandsaw. You know, I'd run it through the joiner and then bandsaw a thin piece, just a little over an eighth of an inch. And then took them all to the sander, the drum sander and thickness sanded to an eighth of an inch. And then I had that jointed edge and I ripped all the stock to an inch and a quarter. So I had these like this. So I had an inch and a quarter strip and once I had all my strips like that, I set up a stop on the table saw. I wish I could show you that, but I'll save that for another time when we're talking about, when we're more focused on cutting small pieces safely and accurately at the table saw. Um, but I cross cut and then I set a stop in such a way that I could safely and accurately and quickly um, make a perfect square. So I just kept cutting them to that exact same. So I end up with a bunch of squares. These are just an inch and a quarter square by an eighth inch thick. So I felt like that on top of this curve would make a nice pattern. You know, if I just started laying those out right now, I could start to see the checkerboard pattern. But I thought it might look more interesting if they were on the diagonal, which when I did it, I didn't realize how much that actually helps them to flex. So this, this guy is pretty short, and when you push pressure, it will, looks like it's almost seated, but it's not quite. But when you put it on the diagonal, now you're going kind of diagonally to the grain. So when you put pressure, it has a little more spring to it. But they're going to have even more spring after we thin them up, because we have to dome these so that they look woven. All right, so that's the plan. I start out with all my little squares of whatever size are appropriate for your panel and then start doming them. Now, you're not limited to squares. That's a great way to start though. I would start with just squares so you create the woven look. On that bed I was telling you about earlier, I made these asymmetrical curved, all this patchwork and it, each one took like a template. It was really crazy and a little over the top, but the effect was pretty sweet. Now I want to uh, start shaping them up. I want to take this square and get it to this thickness. So it's going to taper down to about a 32nd or so. Maybe it could be a little more than that. And it's just by eye. So that one's pretty thin. That's a 32nd. This is a little random. So we're going to create that dome thing. And they have a little more flex to them. But I've got to take this to this. And on that video about the bed, it's called the barn beam bed, by the way, if you want to look it up on our channel. I did it with holding them because they were 3 16 thick and I put all masking tape on my fingers and I was able to sand them because they were large enough. 
they were like about six by six. These things are tiny and I had to have a way. So what I did was I made a way to hold it. Just made a little block and I bordered one of the finished squares with some 16th inch veneer. So that's what that is. That little lip, see that? That's 16th inch veneer. And there was a piece, a little piece on, on each end too, um, but I sanded a lot off and I'll show you why. But I'm left with a nice little stop on each side. So now that piece can fit right in there nicely. Now I thought about how am I gonna hold it in there though, uh, be, being so small. I thought about using double stick tape, but that's a hassle, as you know, <laughs> to try to get that tape off. Every one would be, drive you crazy. Um, but you, maybe you'd have one piece of tape on there, it would last you a little while, then it would get dusty and you'd have to replace it. Um, also, it could be tough to remove. So instead, I decided to just put some little spurs in there. See those little, can you see them? They're actually sticking up and they are um, pin nails and they act like spurs so that when I put the piece on there, I fit it into my little space, I just press down push it down snugly, and it's grabbed on those spurs. So it's held enough to be able to sand this thing curved, um, but not be held so hard that I can't easily pop it off. So I needed a place to hold it, so I just attached a little block to the back. So this is a piece of half-inch plywood boarded by 16th-inch material, and then using those pin nails. Now, just to do those pin nails, I just take a nail gun, my pin nailer, this is approximately half inch material. So I just actually take one inch nails and I intentionally shoot them through. Yeah, you know, little guy sticking it out. Make sure you don't put your finger on the other side. <laughs> I don't think it'll hurt too bad, but it will ad <laughs> adhere to your finger. <laughs> all right, so there, now they're out. And all I do is take some snips and because these don't hit it all the way down to the surface, it's perfect because you just snip them off and then do the other one. Try to get it as low down as you can. You low down. <laughs> it's an old Western term. Uh, so then I snip them nice and low and I've got these little spikes right there. So you can see, you can put the wood up because they're pin nails, they're really thin and they're strong and they last a long time. And you can just push it into the wood and you've got that holding on. So there's no sticky tape and it comes off easily enough, all right? So the pin nail are to the rescue once again. All right, so we're gonna achieve this little doming by sanding them curved. And for that, I'm gonna demonstrate with this guy here. We're gonna head over to our sander. So we're gonna get this in here. Now, every piece we do, we're gonna, we're gonna do the slight doming in the same direction as the grain, okay? I'm gonna set that in there. I have like four little spikes in this one. And there it's seated in my little frame. And I'm just gonna sand. So I'm gonna go from one direction, then I'll turn it around. And I'm just gonna roll it back and just eyeball until I see that edge is down to about a 30 second. Or you, you could go a little heavier, but whatever, that's what I do. Here we go. All right, that's all there is to it. Just pop that out. And there we have it. So now we've got to create the texture. So we've got them domed, but we're still smooth, so we don't have that nice uh, textured look. And here's where woods like wingy and chestnut really shine. Not every wood will take to the texture. Um, some oaks partially, but really not that great. And of course, really even textured woods like 
white pine or hard maple, they're just too, there's not enough gradient difference between the early growth and the late growth of the growth rings. And that's what you need. And it's just trial and error. Just, so I found that wenge is great and chestnut. Of course, it's not available that much, which is kind of sad, but uh, you can find it. I got it from barn beams for the bed, thus the barn beam bed. We're going to go over to the, um, the wire wheel. I'm going to wheel. I'm going to use the wire wheel uh, instead of sandblasting or soji bond. But by putting this into a grinder, this wire is soft enough texture that it won't damage the harder area of the growth rings or the late wood. Um, the, but it'll take out that early growth ring and... I'm going to put on my glasses just in case one of those little wires comes out, but it hardly ever happens. All right, so because it doesn't really hurt that much to touch, I'm able to get close to here and I'll just maneuver it and hit it with both sides. Ready? Let me put this one down. Turn around. See that texture? Nice. Hit the other one. See, you can touch this. It doesn't hurt that bad. <laughs> no, it doesn't actually hurt. Unless you stayed on it. It's sort of like glowing embers. Don't stay on them. All right. I'm sorry, I don't know what the texture is or hardness of that wire, but um, that's like a little six inch wheel that you can get and you can mount on your grinder. Uh, they also have the type that fit in a drill, but I found that just works really nice because you can hold just the workpiece and, and feed it in. So once I've got these textured, of course I need enough to cover my panel. Now this, this one here, uh, actually requires about a hundred, 100. <laughs> so that's a lot, that's a little tedium, right? But you get in a groove and you just do it in stages and it doesn't take all that long. You get going and um, you're gonna have it done in no time. So once I've got them, now I have to get them together and I have to prepare them to be a veneer that I can apply to the substrate. So I'm going to use a straight edge here to help me align them. So now I'm ready to glue them together. And for this, I need my little glue bottle. And all I want to do is put a touch down the edge here. Just got to get a little dot out. And what you have to do is avoid the camera light that's in your face. All right, so there we go. Right there, I'll put that down. And now I can bring... This one in, and I have to, of course, alternate grain direction. And I usually will map these out. I'll have them all kind of laid out so I glue them up in a pleasing order. It's nice if you can have the grain uh, appear to continue like these two do so that it looks like it's diving under and then coming back up again. So I try to keep them organized so I get like a flow so it, it looks more authentic that way. Now you could put a piece of tape over there, but if you just push them together and let it be, it'll be all set. So now I'm going to take this one and I'm going to glue both edges because I'll get, I'll glue on the other side as well. Whoops. You got to be careful. I got such a thin edge on this one, but it'll still work. Don't you worry. All right, we'll get that right on there. And the other side. Beautiful. It's a thing of beauty. That's what my father would say. <laughs> okay, now I'm going to push it together. Nice. And I've got it 
aligned against this straight edge. I want to get glue everywhere. And bring in your another, next one and push it right in too. And that's good. I love it. Okay. So basically if I wanted to make, say, a, a grid of uh, four by four, I would just glue up four strips like this and then I would glue them together. Here's one I already glued up earlier. And check that out. It stays together after you just let that cure. And I didn't put any tape on this or anything. But you gotta handle it lightly because you've got just that little glue bond. So I would bring this one in and this will attach so it keeps the pattern going. So again, we're gonna take the glue and we'll go right down the edge here. Just a thin line. Right down the edge. Yeah, it's like that, right on the shoreline. Now I got a little Bob. Bob, uh, what the heck's his last name again? Bob Ross? Bob Ross, yes. I could see his hair. Here we go. That's all you need. And then we bring it in, and when we bring them together, we want those seams to align. So I want to be careful just to bring that right in. And if we were careful to uh, lay out, you know, cut all our squares accurately, so they're true squares, you will have no problem. Because the length will be the same as the width, and everything will dial right in. And look at that. It looks great. All right, so I get that pulled in. And I could just let that set till it sets up and keep going. You know, glue up another one and another one. And whatever size grid you need. Now, for this box here, I discovered that I need, for the diagonal, I need to put 12 together in a line. So I would just edge glue 12 right along here, and then another, and another. And then, of course, I'm getting shorter here as I get out here, and I'd have to be cutting little miters 45 degree at the overlap and make that all work. So that's, that's a more complex glue up because you got just have longer pieces, but it's essentially the same thing. And once I've got my whole grid, I would have a four by four grid like this. So you can start to see the nice effect of the woven wood and it's really nothing but those thin pieces put together. One of the great things I love about using the wire brush is there's no sanding. You don't have to sand these. Um, between coats of finish, you might get a little ruffle, but you'd have to just kind of quickly touch them. But you really don't have to do hardly anything. However, before I glue them up, I do try to break that edge right here of the, the hump there. Because if that's sharp, it doesn't feel quite as good. And when I do that, I just simply take a little... Uh, 160 and just you can just quickly knock it or you could put it on some paper that was glued to the table and just break that arced edge so it comes together it's it's a hassle you don't want to do it once it's glued up because you're going to be sanding cross grain on the piece next to it i would like to just glue it right onto my my curved panel but i'm a little afraid like once it starts to bend those glue joints, I'm going to probably have some fracturing and breaking. So it's not quite ready yet. It's not a designer veneer quite yet because we need actually some backing. A backer piece of veneer will stabilize this piece and make it really useful and flexible and I won't have to worry about it breaking at all. So this intermediate step of applying the veneer backer is really critical to enjoying success with this, this technique. And for that, I'm just going to use a piece of maple. And one of the things you want to do when you have a square, like a rectangular grid like this, cut your maple at an angle to the piece so that there's no grain like going exactly straight, like in alignment with the, the seams. 
because that won't, that will still crack. So I do have a little angularity on that piece of veneer. When you glue this down, you've got an interesting little puzzle because you've actually got a very uneven surface. So it's hard to just clamp it with a block. I want to put something that kind of fills the gaps and spreads the pressure a little more evenly over there. So you use something like a carpet um, pad, something like that, you know, or even a piece of carpet. And I'm going to use actually a, like a, some cushioning that I got for, I cut it up and use it for floor guides, glides, I mean, um, on chairs that, or tables that might go on a hardwood floor. And it's just that stuff. You can buy this. I forget where I got it. But I got it in a roll. And it has the double stick tape backing. But I don't want to take that off for this. Because this is going to be the cushion that kind of will set on the work. So I'm going to just use a block to pressure this to the backer. But um, in order to do that, I don't want, I want to make sure I don't get any glue squeezing up through the cracks, which it does. There's little tiny holes here and there. So I want to put a piece of paper on there first so I don't glue my beautiful panel to the cushion. <laughs> okay, that's important. All right, so now I'm ready. I'm going to just give this a a bite between two blocks of wood. If it's a larger panel, you'd want to use like a vacuum press or something like that. For now, I'm going to just get some glue on here and we will clamp this up. I'm going to just put some even glue right on the back while we're taking the questions. Okay, go ahead. Bill's asking, have you ever thought about sand shading the edges of each square to emphasize some depth? Oh, wow, Bill. That's a... a Great idea. Yeah, you could do that too. That's like taking it to another level. Oh, Bill asks, have I ever tried sand shading the edges to create an even richer look of depth? Uh, no, Bill, I, I haven't. I actually, um, that's, that's a cool idea though. I mean, on some lighter colored woods, it would work probably great. I, um, I haven't found the need for it really that much, you, but that would add another dimension of uh, light quality and appearance of age. Uh, that's a great technique like on, you see it on 18th century furniture like inlay, um, especially federal pieces like the little bell flowers and stuff like that. But there you have like flat veneer. So you're, you're taking a flat piece and creating the illusion of of um, dimension. So by darkening it, it, it makes it look like a shadow. So here you actually do get shadows because you're, you're not trying to create an illusion of shape. You're actually creating a shape which does catch the light. So it's not as necessary here, but if you could figure out a way to shade, it would probably add even more depth. You'd have to shade it in such a way though that it appeared natural. Um, okay. I have a couple questions about this. Um, is there any issue with the expansion and contraction of the wood when the grain between the pieces is laid perpendicularly? Uh, yeah, the question was, is there any concern for the dimensional change of the wood when the grain is laid like this perpendicularly one to another? Because as you may remember, or the grain will move seasonally with moisture um, with with moisture content expanding and contracting. Like right now, I'm adding moisture to the back, and all the pieces, they want to move like an accordion, so across. So this one would want to expand and contract this way. This one would expand and contract this way. However, they move almost not at all along the length. So it's not moving here. So this piece would be expanding and contracting. And what we're asking is, would that create a problem with this cracking and opening? The answer is, it would if you had too large or too thick of material. And I did a whole bed out of approximately six inch squares. And that would be the line. I don't think I'd go much more than six inch squares. Um, because I didn't have a problem. Because what happens is once you've glued the edges, now you're gluing it to a substrate. You're gluing it to a piece of veneer that's going to further uh, 
hold this in position from expansion and contraction. It's going to back it. And then the whole thing's going to get glued to another substrate to really solidify it. So it's not a concern um, as long as you're staying thin enough with your pieces and um, not so large because the thinness, it can't, this glue strength can't overwhelm. I mean, the thickness of the wood cannot overwhelm the secure approach, the secure um, glue bond against the whole backer. All right, so here I am. I'm going to put my piece of paper in there so I don't get any squeeze through. I'm not worried about the other side of the veneer because it's solid. It's non-porous maple. And then I've got my cushion and my block. So I got a nice sandwich. Cam asked, um, have I tried just weaving thin strips and not using the blocks at all? You, you can, it doesn't give you quite the same effect, um, but I have seen that approach and plus you get a little gaps in at the corners, but one thing I've seen it used at, uh, some of the guys at the prison were making these hampers, uh, like clothes hampers. One of the things I really loved about them is they were woven, and so you had a lot of gaps at the weave for air to come through. So you got these more gaps when, you, when you're weaving like that, like at the, all at the corners. Here, because you've got a solid piece of wood, you're filling it so it's flat on the bottom. So I think that eliminates some of the problems you might have with the material breaking as well. You'd have to be a certain thickness to pull that off. And when you have those pieces going up, uh, you know, it might, it might work. The question is like, where do you glue it? You'd have to just glue it on the bottom. So those pieces that are overlapping the others would not be actually glued to that next one unless you figured out a way to do it. But it would be a gluey mess because you'd be weaving them, right? All right. But that's a great question. I, if somebody would try that and report back, I would like to hear. You can use like canvas or linen or something like that. Foam sheet would be a good cushion. But you can use other backers too. I just prefer wood because I, I trust it gluing down. But you can use like canvas or like a linen, like cloth will adhere as well. But I just feel better with uh, the wood. But there you go. It's in the clamps. And when it comes out, it looks something like this. Now this piece, I put a little shellac on and then wiped it back off. So it's got a nice golden brown color but it doesn't have much finish on it at all so this is one the one i tell, told you about where i glued the grain linear linear in the same line and so when i bent it see that piece it's like wanting to break right there but that won't happen if you're going diagonally with your backer now once you have this now you have a lot of control and you're more relaxed about it coming apart and you can glue it to your core substrate. So in this case, I've got the curved top, which has that nice pleasing uh, curve for our jewelry box. And we're going to put it on in a diagonal like this. And so we want when that glue hits it, it'll suck it right down like that. See how that's going right on across? It'll, it'll bend it right on. So I would put the same glue on there. And I would roll it. This is the way I could roll uh, now the glue on the back or actually on, on your piece, whichever one. And then you're going to set it down and put it in your clamps. Now, I'm not going to glue this one down, but it would be just that process. For this one, it can get glued down on top of the same form that I created this panel with. This lamination, you could go back to designing the jewelry box. I believe we made one of these in that session. But with that form, then I would just slide it into the vacuum bag on top of the form and with some more cushion on there to hold it and some, some paper, let it suck down and bang, you've got a beautiful top. Now, I did take a square and put it in the press and this one did get glued down. So in the manner I just described. So now it's got the angle and it's glued down and the veneer is trimmed. But check that out. Isn't that a cool effect? 
it's just so nice, like tactile and warm to um, wipe over. And uh, you just have a really nice visual of that weaving together. That's how a diamond looks now. I just kind of eyeball put that in the center, but it's almost in the dead center. I did measure it earlier. And, you know, you could just put veneer around the outside of this now and just have like a diamond in the middle, right? You could, you could do that. But I want to fill the whole surface. So I made a larger panel and after it dried, it came out and it actually curved by itself. This is just with the backer on a flat panel. And after it cured, it had this curvature. But this is enough for one of these tops. Let's, let's take a look. What's crazy is after it dried, it took the curvature almost exactly of the top. But I wasn't worried about it coming down because once you, even if it stayed dead flat, it would have the flex in it. But um, it worked out just fine. So I would glue that down. And then I have this large panel, which I can then cross cut on the table saw and I have to get a fine tooth blade because I'd be a little nervous with these little points. You see how it finished out at the end? I needed just a little bit there and I had to cut these little diagonals. It was a little bit of a pain there. But there's about 12 across these diagonals here and I glued them up just in that same process that we just did. So let's take it on to our jewelry box and just get a look-see. See how it looks in that space. Now it does not cut small enough, but we can at least drop it in. Uh, let's see, we got this one. Kind of get a, a look right there. Um, the question is, have I given any thought to a hinged top? Uh, yes, I mean, I, I've got a few options for hinging this, this jewelry box. I've got regular butt hinges, which could be attached here and here. Um, then there's the sauce hinges, which get kind of inlaid. And I'm not sure knife hinges would work here. Let's see. But, uh, you know, there are small hinges you can get to work. I haven't gone deep enough with the hinges yet. I did get some small ones from Horton Brass's butt hinges, which are... Uh, look like the appropriate size. They have a half inch leaf which would fit perfectly on this material here and then the leaf it would be up into this here. But then you have this issue of what's going to stop it from going all the way back. We don't want that. You're either going to have like a little chain here that would hold it at that or some of the hinges actually do have a built-in stop at just past 90. So it would actually stop right there. With veneer, a lot of times your question is like, do I edge it first and then have put my veneer on top and have that little veneer like overlapping the edge veneer? And with veneer regular thickness, it's not really a big deal because by the time you break the edge, you can't even tell hardly. But usually on a panel like this, you're going to have more of a solid wood edge where a thicker sawn veneer will be actually edged first and then you'll be veneering so you don't have to worry about cutting through it it's going to need to be more durable than just a piece of thin veneer on a working lid like this so i would probably i, I decided i'm going to glue it down first and then edge it after and you may say, but Tom, you're going to see the edging come up. And that's true. But the edging actually overlaps a lot of this end grain. So that grain's going to be running this way. And you blend it in by breaking it. And it looks fine. It's going to be an edge. It's going to be thin enough. I'm guessing probably about a heavy 16th uh, edging. And by the time you break it, it's really hard to even pick it up. I know this because I used that method on the um, barn beam bed. I had to edge the top edge of the bed and I went with strips aligned after it was veneered and then I was able to blend the edging to the contours of the woven pieces. 
and it was it just kind of blends right in and you make it warmer a little softer but the underside I'm just gonna put some nice veneer under there so when you open it it's a nice look I mean you could go really crazy you could you could make a checkered veneered panel like it was all just flat veneer and just make it like a parquet but with veneer thickness and you'll get um, kind of like a reflection of what's on top but without the three dimensions um, you could put a, a little mirror in here if you could figure out a way to attach it um, being curved it'll be a little trouble trouble to do that but you could figure that out but I'm gonna just veneer it with some material and then edge it I do have some chestnut flat veneer I could do it with that but usually it's gonna relate to your piece the material on your sides or maybe the lid depends what kind of brightness you want when you open it up all right well I hope you enjoyed that that's really fun to explore uh, creating your own veneers in this case it's a designer veneer that you can apply and give you that patchwork woven effect you know what I almost forgot to say please subscribe like share if you enjoy this content thanks for being here being part of this on behalf of the camera and myself we look forward to seeing you next time right back here 